Chapter 15 Notes on the Law in Western Society In the canons of the early church, the importance of biblical law is readily apparent. The church has clearly felt that biblical law was binding on believers. Not all went as far nor were as literal as the Church of Armenia, in which in those days and for centuries thereafter, quote, only those are appointed to the clerical orders who are of priestly descent, following in this Jewish customs, end quote. This practice was condemned by Canon 23 of the Quinisext Council, or the Council in Trullo, in A.D. 692. Canon 99 of the same council referred also to the fact that, quote, certain persons boil joints of meat within the sanctuary and offer portions to the priests, distributing it after the Jewish fashion, end quote. Strabo gives an account of a similar custom in the West in the 9th century. But this is not all. The Armenian church had animal sacrifices after the Old Testament law, continuing them long after the Jews abandoned them, well into the 20th century. These took place at the church door and were a free will offering to the Lord, commemorating the Old Testament sacrifices and given as a result of vows made to the Lord as a part of prayer. The animal had to be Levitically acceptable, a yearling and free from all blemish, according to the law. The prayer read in part as follows, quote, For through thy blessed prophet Moses thou enjoined on thy people Israel to offer up to thee sacrifices, of their flocks and sheep and of other pure animals, bringing them to the door of the tent of witness to the Levite priests, who should lay their hands on them and pour out their blood on thy holy altar, O Lord. And thereby sins were expiated and petitions fulfilled. Yet in all this thou prefigured as in a shadow the things to come, that true salvation, which thou hast graciously given us through thy coming into the world, for thou thyself, all merciful and beneficent Lord, through thy foreseeing spirit, declared by the prophet, saying, I accept not of your spears the fat, but offer a sacrifice of praise to God, and with willing mind tender unto God a bloodless victim. For is there not the saying, The sacrifice of God is an afflicted spirit, and a humble spirit doth God not despise? So now that we have sinned and are unworthy, humbled in our hearts, fall down before thine infinite pity, and supplicate for thy abundant love of mankind and mercy, and for thy unfailing promise which thou made to thy beloved ones, to our fathers. Condescend, O Lord, to this our offering, and accept it from our hands, even as thou didst the whole burnt offerings of rams and steers, and as thou didst the innumerable offerings of fat lambs. Graciously grant our petitions, that we may not become the sport of our enemies, but rather rejoice in thy salvation. For if thou weighed all the mountains and the plains in thy glance, and holdest heaven and earth in the hollow of thy hand, and sittest in the height of heights on the throne of the cherubim, and the abysses are not hidden from thee, and all four-footed animals and all that have the breath of life suffice thee not for the whole burnt offering, how dare we to presume before thee, and to offer sacrifice?" End quote. The Greek church also had prayers for animal sacrifices. The Levitical regulations concerning the priesthood were also applied to the clergy of the church, and Leviticus 21, 17-23 was carefully obeyed. Since eunuchs were thus barred from the ministry, a problem was created when Rome or the barbarians deliberately castrated the clergy to destroy their validity of orders or ordination. The Council of Nicaea in 381 declared that, quote, those castrated by barbarians could remain among the clergy, end quote, in view of the circumstances of their blemish. The Council of Ansara, Canon 11 in AD 314, had to consider the cases of betrothed virgins who had been raped. In such cases, no blemish was ascribed to the girl. The canonical epistle of St. Gregory Thaumaturgus made a similar point in Canon 1. Ansara, in Canon 21, dealt severely with abortion, ten years of penance. Transvestites were excommunicated. Various sexual offenses were repeatedly cited as cause of lifelong excommunication, since the Church had no power to enforce a death penalty. Murder, divination, the worship of angels, heresy, and other matters were dealt with in terms of the biblical law, as far as the Church could go. Restitution was basic to Canon law and to penance. The Apostolic Constitutions cite it in Canon 72, as did St. Gregory Thaumaturgus in his canonical epistle Canon 8. The canons and regulations concerning the Sabbath are of a special interest. Timothy, Bishop of Alexandria, required that man and wife forbear from, quote, the conjugal act on Saturday and the Lord's Day, for on those days the spiritual sacrifice is offered, end quote. This was in terms of Exodus 19.15, and was designed to separate any fertility cult element from worship. 
Christians were not always free to rest on the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, and necessity was thus a legitimate excuse. Respect for the Jewish Sabbath, however, was forbidden. Quote, Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's Day, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. End quote. Because the Lord's Day was a time of rest and joy, fasting on Sunday was condemned and required excommunication. The same council, Gangra, condemned those who condemned marriage, Canon 1. It condemned vegetarianism, Canon 2. It condemned those who separated themselves from a married clergy, Canon 4, and so on. The early church thus clearly obeyed biblical law. This is not to say that its obedience was by any means perfect. Custom at times overruled the law. The first canonical epistle of Basil, Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, to Amphilochius, Bishop of Iconium, made note of this in Canon 9, quote, Our Lord is equal to the man and woman forbidding divorce, save in case of fornication. But custom requires women to retain their husbands, though they be guilty of fornication, end quote. There was, however, no lack of intelligent application of the law. Thus, Canons 33 and 52 of Basil declared that child neglect which led to death was murder. The Church thus was mindful of the centrality of biblical law to Christian faith, and its canon law was the application of the rule of that law to the problems of life. The Church, however, was within the framework of the Roman Empire and Roman law. It is necessary to cite briefly some aspects of the interpretations of Roman law within the context of Christian faith. Rome had reached a centralization and oversimplification of the control of men, which had begun to hamper and destroy social order. C. Dickerman Williams has said of the period of the Theodosian Code, A.D. 313-468, through 468, quote, The Theodosian Code and novels concern a period in history much like ours in many of its problems. But in that day, it was no longer possible to attempt to solve problems by greater centralization and officialdom. At the time of the earliest edict included in the Code, the centralization of society could go no further because it was already complete. An area which was for its inhabitants the entire world had been welded into a single organization. Social, economic, and religious activities were administered or rigidly controlled by the state. The authority of the emperor was unchallenged. The edicts compiled in the Theodosian Code and novels represent the often desperate efforts to make the system work. But during these years, it was the tendency to disintegration that was irresistible. The enactments designed to keep the organization together failed. Within only a few years after the last of the edicts, the empire had been shattered into a thousand fragments. Thus, that era, unlike ours, was one of disintegration, albeit a disintegration that was most involuntary." End quote. Exhaustion, spiritual and physical, was destroying the empire. The centralization of power only aggravated the basic irresponsibility which had led to the destruction of resources. Williams is again to the point in his comment, quote, Now the empire's problem was shortages, shortages of grain, of materials, and of men. Throughout the Mediterranean basin, agriculture had been operated to supply the distant mistress of the world. The rewards of the consumer had been too attractive, those for the producer, not enough. Lands, especially in Italy, had gone out of cultivation. Areas in Africa from which Rome had drawn grain and meat for centuries were becoming desert. Spain and other countries had been deforested to provide fuel for the public baths of Rome. The decline of the Roman Empire is a story of deforestation, soil exhaustion, and erosion. From Spain to Palestine, there are no forests left in the Mediterranean littoral. The region is pronouncedly arid instead of having the mild, humid character of forest-clad lands, and most of its former bounteously rich topsoil is lying at the bottom of the sea. White and Jack's Vanishing Lands, page 8. Today, it is fashionable in some quarters to scoff at occasional warnings of the exhaustion of natural resources. Such levity would have found no echo at the courts of the later emperors, end quote. The emperors were helpless to reverse the trend. Power had been centralized, and the empire was now in the hands of the emperor and his bureaucracy, who could not begin to cope with the problems on the grassroots level, where most of the problems were. Quote, the management of the gigantic administrative machine was simply beyond their capacity, end quote. After a certain point of centralization, a bureaucracy becomes unrelated to reality. It is busy managing management and governing the machinery of power. Quote, the wonder is that the empire's territorial integrity was preserved so long, end quote. 
After a certain point, a bureaucracy also becomes cannibalistic. Quote, the emperors relied for their political support upon the urban proletariat, especially that of the city of Rome, and upon the civil and military bureaucracy. To maintain that support, it was necessary to favor those consumer elements in the population, especially vis-a-vis -vis the rural producers. The effect of that policy was to discourage production and to tempt the farmers to move to the cities. The code and the novels show that in order to get supplies for the city dwellers and government personnel, it was then necessary to adopt harsh measures such as rural serfdom and taxes payable in kind. The enforcement of such measures required an increased state apparatus of administration and repression, which in turn withdrew more and more men from production. The harassed farm managers, continually under pressure to meet their quotas of supplies, could pay little attention to the conservation of soil and forests. Their consequent deterioration accentuated the difficulties of production. The state machine finally became so complex as to be unmanageable." End quote. As a result, it was then possible for wandering tribes of barbarians to bring about the fall of Rome. The empire had disintegrated because of its inner decay. The disintegration of Roman law was equally real. The Theodosian Code shows the influences of Christianity, but it is still Roman law. In analyzing the laws of marriage, we have noted the radical Christianization of Roman law under Justinian I, circa AD 482 to 565. In the Corpus Juris Civilis, Roman law now continued in its development, but it became progressively an expression of biblical law. Justinian's institutes with the Digest, Code, and Novels, a part of the Corpus Juris Civilis, clearly reflects what is called quote-unquote natural law but that concept was now becoming something other than Roman law had known it. Natural law, whether in the hands of jurists, scholastics, or deists, was in essence an anti-Trinitarian doctrine, but it was still more Christian than Roman. Natural law became a form of Christian heresy and ascribed to nature legislative powers and absolute laws which were clearly borrowed from the God of Scripture. Thus, both Roman law and natural law became so thoroughly Christianized with the centuries that no Roman would have recognized them. Even where the wording of ancient Roman laws was retained, a new content and interpretation rendered the ancient meaning remote and barren. The same is true of pagan laws. Clearly, many pagan laws survived and colored Western law codes, but again they were subjected to radical alteration in most cases. Moreover, it must be noted that a very real defect of scholars has been their ignorance of biblical law. As a result, much has been called pagan, which was in reality biblical. Thus, in a Harvard scholar's source book on medieval history, we are told concerning Alfred the Great in 9th century England, quote, Here are a few characteristic laws included by Alfred in the code which he drew up on the basis of old customs and the laws of some of the earlier Saxon kings. If anyone smite his neighbor with a stone or with his fist, and he nevertheless can go out with a staff, let him get him a physician and do his work as long as he himself cannot. If an ox gore a man or a woman so that they die, let it be stoned and let not its flesh be eaten. The owner shall not be liable if the ox were wont to push with its horns for two or three days before, and he knew it not. But if he knew it and would not shut it in, and it then shall have slain a man or a woman, let it be stoned and let the master be slain, or the person killed be paid for, as the quote-unquote witten shall decree to be right. Injure ye not the widows and the stepchildren, nor hurt them anywhere. For if you do otherwise, they will cry unto me, and I will hear them, and I will slay you by my sword, and I will cause that your own wives shall be widows, and your children shall be stepchildren. If a man strike out another's eye, let him pay sixty shillings, and six shillings and six pennies, and a third part of a penny, as quote-unquote bot, compensation rendered to an injured person. If it remain in the head, and he cannot see anything with it, let one-third of the bot be remitted. If a man strike out another's tooth in the front of his head, let him make bot for it with eight shillings. If it be the canine tooth, let four shillings be paid as bot. A man's grinder is worth fifteen shillings. If the shooting finger be struck off, the bot is fifteen shillings. For its nail, it is four shillings. If a man maim another's hand outwardly, let twenty shillings be paid as bot. If he can be healed, if it half fly off, then shall forty shillings be paid as bot. End quote. These are, of course, clearly biblical laws adapted to the English coinage and scene. Biblical law played a central role in the shaping of Western civilization as it entered society from still another source, the Jews of Europe.
Unfortunately, the history of the Jews as normally reported tends to stress their sufferings rather than their accomplishments. This is an unhappy preoccupation which characterizes many other able peoples, but it is not good history, whether done by Jews, Armenians, Poles, Frenchmen, U.S. Southerners, or anyone else. Western civilization owes a large debt to the culture of its towns and cities. Towns and cities were products of merchantmen and their communities, and these were largely Jewish. Commercial law and urban law thus had their origins in the Jewish communities and their intense devotion to biblical law. While some Syrians or Phoenicians continued into the Christian era as the merchants of Europe as Christian merchantmen, increasingly the major role was played by Jews. The influence of the Jews on their Christian imitators in the commercial realm was extensive. Their power also was very great. In a work of very great importance, Irving A. Agus has written, quote, Moreover, it was in the centuries preceding the Crusades that this remarkable group played a most heroic role in northwestern Europe. The few thousand Jews that constituted this group in the pre-Crusade period were so powerful that they bent the rulers of Europe to their will. They forced these rulers to bring about a radical change in basic church policy toward the Jews. The latter were allowed to practice their religion undisturbed, to employ Christian servants, and sometimes even Christian slaves, to hold positions of authority over Christians, and to manage the financial activities of large estates, even of bishoprics. These few Jews forced the prelates of the church to become their benefactors. In the midst of almost universal personal subjugation, the Jews alone were politically free. In the midst of turbulence and war, they alone could travel in comparative safety and could carry valuable merchandise over long distances. When practically every man owed to his superior services and dues that constituted a sacrifice of from 15 to 50 percent of his income producing time, the Jews paid as taxes but a tiny fraction of their income. They organized self-governing communities, developed supra-communal institutions, enacted ordinances on a national scale, and employed a most efficient and most remarkable form of group organization and group government, one that afforded every individual effective help and protection even when he was hundreds of miles away from home. They instituted practices and procedures that gave them great power and resilience, enabled them to deal with the princes of church and state from a position of strength, and created for them opportunities for powerful economic growth and great physical expansion." End quote. This power was grounded in a systematic and faithful obedience to biblical law, to a system of justice which maintained the community in times of difficulty and gave it an instrument for coping with internal and external affairs. Life in a community meant life in the law of God. In terms of this, the modern city, a product of Jewish merchantmen and their communities, is a unit brought together by law, not by blood, and maintained by justice essentially, rather than by brute force. These Jewish courts were moreover stateless courts, forerunners of the medieval fair courts and of modern arbitration. The influence of Maimonides, Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, 1135-1204, on European thought rests on this urban orientation of Jewish life and thought. As medieval Europe became urban Europe, it looked to the fathers of urban life. Maimonides had codified the Jewish applications of biblical law to urban and commercial life, and as a result his influence was inescapable. Maimonides is best remembered for his influence on European philosophy, for helping introduce Aristotelianism into European thought, as well as into Judaism. His philosophical works were denounced by the Jews of Provence to the Inquisition, which burned these writings. His compendium of biblical law, much neglected by scholars today, was far more influential in his day than even his philosophical writings. In a Europe intensely concerned with law, with the development of cities and of national states, Maimonides' legal studies were important. Because of their common allegiance with differences to biblical law, Christians and Jews were very close in their relations then, as well as very much at odds at times. The biblical nature of Maimonides' legal studies made them influential. Another source by means of which biblical law has exercised a major influence on Western civilization has been through the common law. Whatever local customs or elements of Roman law there may be in it, common law is essentially biblical law. Quote, common law was Christian law, end quote. As Keaton noted, quote, the judges of earlier times spoke with a certainty which was derived from their conviction that the common law was an expression of Christian doctrine, which none challenged, end quote. In trying to eliminate biblical law from Western civilization, scholars have studiously strained out whole herds of camels in search of gnats. <laughs>
The importance of the tithe in the development of Western civilization deserves study, but at present an assessment of its part is not possible. There are indications, however, that the tithe was basic to social reforms and ecclesiastical reforms, to education and to welfare, and that the tithe was a major factor in social change and progress. Some of the English Puritans were not entirely happy with the established form of the tithe as a part of a stagnant establishment, but their own voluntarily given tithes and offerings were responsible for the extensive reshaping of English society. In America, especially in New England as a part of the Christian conservatism, a harking to the past and radicalism, a return to the root of matters of the pilgrims and Puritans, as well as other colonists, there was a self-conscious adoption of biblical law. The attitude was best summed up by John Cotton in Moses, his Judicials, when he observed, quote, The more any law smells of man, the more unprofitable, end quote. Significantly, when Massachusetts in 1641 framed its laws in terms of the English and Puritan understanding of biblical law, that document was called the Body of Liberties. God, having called man to serve him through the law, had made that law man's charter of liberty. The Puritans took very literally the words of Isaiah 33:22, which, as they cited it, reads, Jehovah is our judge. Jehovah is our lawgiver. Jehovah is our king. He will save us. Cotton's earlier summary of law had been theoretical. The body of liberties was biblical in perspective, but directly applied to the problems of the colony, and hence a practical code concerned with immediate matters. The fidelity of the laws of Massachusetts to Scripture tends to be underrated at times by scholars, and Powers, who gives occasional evidence of this, still provides abundant evidence of the biblical character of the law. A committee of the general court repudiated the quote-unquote Jewish code in 1851, but it clearly had been in force earlier. Where the legislators moved into areas not covered by biblical law, they did so, quote, according to the more general rules of righteousness, end quote, as the New Haven Colony Laws made clear, quote, This court thus frames, shall first with all care and diligence from time to time provide for the maintenance of the purity of religion, and suppress the contrary, according to their best light and directions from the word of God. Secondly, though they humbly acknowledge that the supreme power of making laws and of repealing them belongs to God only, and that by him this power is given to Jesus Christ as mediator, Matthew 28, 19, John 5, 22, and that the laws for holiness and righteousness are already made and given us in the scriptures, which in matters moral or of moral equity may not be altered by human power or authority, Moses only showed Israel the laws and statutes of God and the Sanhedrin, the highest court among the Jews must attend those laws. Yet civil rulers and courts, and this general court in particular, being entrusted by the freemen, as before, are the ministers of God for the good of the people, and have power to declare, publish, and establish for the plantations within their jurisdictions the laws he hath made, and to make and repeal orders for smaller matters, not particularly determined in Scripture, according to the more general rules of righteousness, and while they stand in force, to require due execution of them." End quote. Precisely because lawyers, courts, and scholars today are usually radical humanists and anti-Christian, there is commonly a hostility towards any full acknowledgment of the biblical nature of the legal heritage of Western civilization. On the contrary, the effort is to dismantle that legal structure and to replace it with humanistic law. Such a challenge is not new. It has been repeatedly attempted over the centuries, and one such attempt culminated in Renaissance tyranny. The force of biblical law has thus ebbed and flowed. Some aspects of that law have retained greater force than others. Criminal law has been very much a product of the biblical requirements. Dietary observances very steadily lost their force in most areas as far as pork and shellfish are concerned, and horse meat in France, although retaining their force with some peoples. Diet is less readily affected by conversion than are other aspects of a people's life, because diet is usually closely linked to the economic limitations of a society. Moreover, with the passing of the centuries, the stricter faithfulness of the Jews tended to condemn dietary laws as anti-Jewish feelings arose. As against the barbarian converts to Christianity, the Jewish communities represented a higher moral and cultural level. It should be remembered that the Saxons, for example, practiced human sacrifice until after 20 years of war, Charlemagne both defeated them and compelled their baptism in AD 782 in order to break the tie to offensive pagan practices, 
Only by means of placing the Saxons under the sign of the God of Scripture, whose wrath would be manifested against those who practiced such rites as human sacrifice, was a break made with the past. Their forcible conversion made the Saxons and other peoples open to civilization, but their level of accomplishment was clearly below that of the Jews for some centuries. People hate few things in others more than superiority. The hostilities were thus real. They were not helped by the fact that Jews, as merchantmen, often dealt in Christian slaves. As slave owners, the Jews were vulnerable, in that by law, a slave owned by a Jew gained his freedom if he became a Christian. Hostility to Jews thus became hostility in many cases to kosher laws, and many people at times took a delight in trying to render Jewish wines ritually impure. The lack of a knowledge of Scripture because of an inability to read furthered the division and aggravated the ignorance of many biblical ordinances. Moreover, as time passed, the interpretation of some laws became ecclesiastical rather than social. Thus, the Sabbath, very clearly ordained for rest, came steadily to mean worship and the church. A secondary application came to be the primary emphasis and meaning. The requirement to rest and to rest in the Lord is still basic to Scripture. It means a rest for man, his working animals, and for the earth. In this respect, the strictest Sabbatarian churches are clearly derelict in their Sabbath keeping. The Sabbath law is still necessary for man, as is the whole law, and its observance is mandatory for the health of society. The church, having in one area after another abandoned the law of God, or having reduced it to a purely ecclesiastical or moral concern, has led society in its dereliction. John Cotton was right, quote, The more any law smells of man, the more unprofitable. Humanistic law has led to social chaos and crisis. It is time to turn again with the Puritans to the words of Isaiah 33:22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Humanistic man seeks salvation from man, sometimes through politics and the state, at other times by means of anarchism. But anarchism leads to social collapse and warfare, and the state, reflecting man's sin, can only compound it. Father Francis Edward Nugent has cited, after Fulton Lewis III, the corruption of members of Congress, and has added, quote, the state legislatures are no less open to the low and corrupt. Consider unhappy New Hampshire, where the House of Representatives now sitting includes one man who was convicted of using the mails to defraud, another who was arrested for stealing an ambulance while under the influence of drink, and a third who was convicted of the statutory rape of a mentally retarded 15-year-old girl." End quote. Clearly, with the growing decline of public and private morality, no arrangement of men or political institutions can provide relief. The evil is primarily in man, and in his institutions and environment, insofar as they reflect his nature. Rabshakeh was right with reference to Egypt. Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. 2 Kings 18.21 The future does not rest with pierced hand politics, but with the sovereign and triune God and his absolute law.